Welcome to the FinTech One-on-One Podcast. This is Peter Renton, Chairman and Co-Founder of FinTech Nexus. I've been doing this show since 2013, which makes this the longest running one-on-one interview show in all of FinTech. Thank you for joining me on this journey. If you like this podcast, you should check out our sister shows, The FinTech Blueprint with Lex Sokolin and FinTech Coffee Break with Isabel Castro. Or listen to everything we produce by subscribing to the FinTech Nexus podcast channel. Before we get started, I want to tell you about the many opportunities you have to reach the FinTech Nexus community. We have an entire suite of digital products that include webinars, in-depth white papers and case studies. We have advertising opportunities within our newsletter, website, and podcasts. We also do sponsored articles, dedicated emails, and much more. We can create a custom program designed just for you. If you want to reach a senior fintech audience, then please contact sales at fintechnexus.com today. Today on the show, I'm delighted to welcome David Watson. He is the CEO of The Clearinghouse. Now, most of you will have heard of The Clearinghouse. They are a huge payments infrastructure company owned by some of the largest banks operating in this country. Uh, In this show, we talk about the different types of payments. We talk about ACH, we talk about wire, even checks and all the checks that are flowing through their system today. And of course, we talk about RTP, their real-time payments network. We talk about what it is, how the technology works, what kinds of financial institutions are using it. We talk about the differences between RTP and FedNow and whether or not FedNow has actually been a good thing for RTP. We talk about the um, different types of technologies being developed today. David gives his perspective on some of those. He also provides his vision for the future of instant payments and much more. It was a fascinating discussion. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, David. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, Peter. Okay, great to have you. So, you know, let's get started by giving the listeners a little bit of background about yourself. Uh, like me, it sounds like you're an immigrant to this country. Tell us how you arrived here and just some of the highlights of your career to date. Certainly, yeah. No, I mean, originally from Scotland and sort of landed in the US in uh, 2011 via a variety of different European financial centers. I spent the bulk of my career with Deutsche Bank running different payments and transaction banking product and business lines before deciding uh, in 2019 uh, to sort of change track a little bit and uh, and move into the market infrastructure sector where I moved over to Swift to run strategy and eventually product over there before I joined the Clearinghouse uh, seven months ago. What was the impetus? What did you see at the Clearinghouse that was really attractive for you? The opportunity to come in and really help change the industry here in the US and help drive it towards the future state of payments that is continuing to get much greater in terms of noise and attention was one that it's very hard not to be interested in. And when you look at the role the Clearinghouse plays at the foundation of the US economy and the payments infrastructure for over 170 years, the ability to actually help uh, our adopted home team, if you like, in the US market really drive industry-wide transformation and and collaborative transformation is something that it's hard to to turn down. And I think for me, the real sales pitch was, would I rather help an individual corporation or bank help its P&L, or would I like to come to the clearinghouse and help drive industry change and industry progression towards the future was really what resonated with me and, and my passion for payments really brought me here as part of that. Right, right. So then... You mentioned the Clearinghouse has been around for, for quite a while. Can you just give us a, a little bit of the history about how the Clearinghouse came to be and how that, that's evolved into what it, what it does today? If we think about what the Clearinghouse does today, it's kind of the same as it was formed to do 170 years ago. So we run highly reliable payment systems. So whether that's for the more, more modern real-time payments, the ACH payments infrastructure, the wire business for high value payments or our check clearing processing that we do. We're really there to help bring settlement 
and, and safety and security and reliability to the financial services settlement of payments. That actually is what we were founded to do 170 years ago, where our job in New York was to help banks settle payments between each other. Of course, back then it was still check, but it was more checks, currency, and even gold that we used to settle between the institutions. Hmm. Historically, we've played a major role in the sort of growth and stability of the banking system, first in New York and then eventually in the United States. And we were the Fed before the Fed as a way of thinking about it. So obviously, the clearinghouse organized from the private sector by banks stepped in during times of crisis to make sure the banking system continued to function smoothly. We printed money and held gold all before the Federal Reserve Bank and the government institution that is that existed. So we have a, a long a long history in payments and today owned primarily by 22 of the nation's largest financial institutions. We provide collaborative and competing options versus the government's payment and settlement systems they offer through the Federal Reserve. Before we get into the meat of it, I'd like to get a sense of the scale that you know of the US payment system. Can you just give me some sense of what volume of payments flow through the U.S. financial system? Studies from the uh, American Banking Association, the ABA, have, have estimated that there's around just under $130 trillion of business that happens across the different payment cycles. And, and that's come through from different Federal Reserve payment studies, at ABA, various places. You know, we ourselves clear and settle over $2 trillion in payments alone through our own networks. Over what time period? Two trillion dollars over per day. Per day, okay. Trillion a day. Wow. Per day. So, so if you think about the the size and scale of that, is massive. And really, what we are seeing and continue to see for the last 10, 20 years, and even accelerated by the the sort of the pandemic we've all been through, is the explosion in payment volumes, and particularly in payment volumes in those new sectors around instant payments, real time payments payments with richer data, different types of new and modern networks, and continue to see a lot of innovation as a result that comes hand in hand with that growth. So it's a, it's a pretty colossal market, the US payment system. Right, right. And there's, so the clearinghouse, you said you, you got, like you said, 22 banks, like owners of your organization. Does that mean that you primarily work with 22 banks or do you work with the entire financial system as far as credit unions and banks? Yeah, I would most definitely work. We work with the entire ecosystem. You know, our ownership structure is one thing. Um, who we service is obviously something completely different. Our, our sort of mandate from our owners is not to turn a profit directly for them or for ourselves. Or it's very much around how we, as a financial services industry, can move forward in terms of innovation, but also maintain that safety, security, reliability that we've provided for so many years. If we think about some examples like our new real-time payment system, more than 90, 90 percent of the of the banks who use that network are actually small to medium enterprises per se. Mm. And at the end of the day, whether a bank is big or a bank is small, what's important when it comes to payments is the eventual ubiquity of solutions like ACH, Wire, and eventually real-time, enabling all customers of all institutions, regardless of size, to have the access to state-of-the-art payment capabilities regardless to who they bank with. Right, right. Got it. Okay. So I want to go through some of the different payment types before we get to RTP. And I want to start with ACH. Obviously, it's been around for 50 plus years. It's probably the most used of all of the different payments uh, flows. But can you explain, if someone's making an ACH payment, a business making an ACH payment to another business or a consumer. Can you explain how the flow of funds works and where does the clearinghouse kind of get involved in that flow? Sure. I mean, ACH is the is the kind of plain vanilla mass payment system, if you like. It's designed as a batch-based clearing and settlement system, or clearing being the sort of the, the messaging and the pairing up of, of payments between two sides and settlement being the confirmation of the movement of funds from one person to another that happens at the, the end of the process. And really that ACH batch-based system was designed for high volume um, within business hour payment files and individual transactions to happen. That clearing happens obviously before settlement, sometimes that same day, sometimes the next day or more. So it's not designed for instant payment capabilities. It was designed in essence to make sure things happen. The funds themselves can be pulled from a payer's account. We call that a debit ACH. 
or pushed out to a pay, a so-called credit ACH. Mm -hmm. And those things happen within business hours, not over weekends or holidays, and that certain ACH items can settle provisionally with final settlement, settlement only occurring after a passage of time. So we often refer to ACH as a delayed settlement mechanism. There are some same-day ACH capabilities. There's, there's very small uh, volumes of those that happen, and they are limited also by business hours, but the majority of payments are settled the next day or in a couple of days, or, you know, sometimes over weekends and holidays, three to four days. But it's a, it's a very robust, fantastic, all-reaching system designed primarily for those batch-based uh, clearing and settlement mechanisms. And what is the clearinghouse's role in that process? Yeah, certainly. Our, our role, much like it is for the other check, RTP, and, and wire businesses we have, is to provide that clearing and settlement mechanism. Mm -hmm. So we are the, the place where the matching happens and, the, and the, the confirmation and movement of funds and settlement happens. And that tends to happen with ourselves, with ACH, or with the Fed. So we are each operators of ACH systems, governed by NASHA, and our systems are interoperable. So people can send their full payment flows to the clearinghouse to clear and settle. We will clear and settle those that happen across our network, and those that need to clear and settle into accounts that sit on the Fed's network with institutions who use the Fed. We have a, for want of a better word, a pipe that exists between the Fed and the clearinghouse to ensure the cross-settlement of those transactions also. So it has complete ubiquity across the market. Right. Got it. Okay. Okay. So then what about wire and wire has also been around for a long time. It's obviously faster than ACH, but is the, is anything different with wire other than speed? Yeah. I think if we were to look at it just as a simple product comparison, wire tends to be high value and, and speedier and more expensive as a result, as you would right. expect. And that's the main difference between wire and ACH. If I sort of step back and, and think about it in lay person's terms. When I look at the difference between what the clearinghouse does for wire and the Fed, we have a slight enhanced proposition there where not just speed and, and sort of the ability to hold large sums of money move with finality quickly, we also offer within our CHIPS product the ability to actually manage your liquidity a bit clearer. So when it comes to wire business at the Fed, you obviously need to fund every payment before it can go out your account or use your overdraft. So each payment uses its own amount of liquidity equivalent to the value of the payment itself. What we do at the clearinghouse with chips is, in essence, the same files, formats, capabilities, and confirmation of payment, but we manage the liquidity with participants matching payments off during the day, thus making it a much more efficient process for banks who use chips versus who use the Fed when it comes to liquidity savings. Got it. Got it. Okay. So then... What about checks? Do you still, you, I presume you are still working with checks today. I mean, there's, there's less volume, but it's nowhere near zero. So how are you processing physical pieces of paper? No, it's, it's a great point, right? I think uh, I run a payments company with state-of-the-art payments capabilities. And, and as we'll talk about soon, one of the first, or should I say, one of the newest payment networks uh, with RTP has been launched in 40 years, you know, XFED now the last few weeks. But yes, even this morning, I wrote a check to my uh, local PBA, Police Benevolent Association, as a donation. So that check business is still alive and well, despite how we may wish it to perhaps not be. But what we do here at the Clearinghouse is, again, the same thing. We process checks. We then uh, enable their clearing and settlement. And we do that using check images. So in this day and age where either through your mobile phone, through your banking app, or within a bank branch uh, where they capture the image of a check, those images of those checks are then used to clear and settle funds between the different banks and between different accounts. And that's the same role we play, providing that confirmation of settlement, you know, the removal of aspects of that settlement risk, and actually the pairing off of two sides of a payment transaction as articulated by that original piece of paper uh, that's there. We definitely do continue to see a reduction in check volumes, and I think as we see the rollout of real-time payments from ourselves and the Fed and various other propositions in the marketplace from card companies and other places, we will continue to see the, the reduction in checks. We are, as an industry, seeing a bit of an increase in check fraud, actually, in the last sort of 12 to 18 months, which I think will accentuate as an industry our conversations around 
is Czech still fit for purpose for many of these types of payments that are still flowing over it today? Or should we be more assertively shifting those to some of the more state-of-the-art real-time payment systems? Well, let's talk about real-time payments, RTP. You launched this, I think, five years ago. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you've built exactly and how the technology works. Certainly, yeah. I mean, yeah, five years ago, we, we went live with, as I say, the, the first new bank payment infrastructure built in the US in over 50 years. And we did so using pretty modern architecture and some much richer global messaging and data standards, which really means that what we have with RTP or real-time payments, our RTP network, is a bank account-based real-time clearing and settlement infrastructure. So whereas what I spoke about before tends to be with ACH or check a delayed settlement mechanism. This is the instant uh, and final funds movement with immediate irrevocable funds availability 24 by 7. And that is the, the, the first time in the US we've had such a network. And, and recently, of course, FedNow has joined us on that journey. But each individual RTP payment clears and settles simultaneously, a little bit like wire and instantly, but also 24 by 7. Um, we do have a current cap of a million dollars on the real-time payments network. And um, that's something that's grown over time and will continue to do so. But I would say that each RTP payment does indeed provide confirmation to the sender that funds have been received by the beneficiary within seconds. So the idea that when I pay you, the money actually moves immediately and I know that you have the money immediately versus other mechanisms where either I think you have the money instantly because it's happened over a payment fintech app or a banking app, but actually the settlement happens over ACH in a delayed manner one or two days later. Or in a check example where you're maybe even you're mailing it somewhere and the funds, who knows when they'll come out of your account. But with real-time payments 24 by 7, that settlement happens there and then. And very importantly, you and I are both aware of that confirmation of the movement of funds pretty much instantaneously. Right, right. So are all 22 of the the banks involved in um, the clearinghouse, are they all using RTP today? I mean, what about smaller community banks? Are any credit unions involved? Yeah, sure. Look, financial institutions of, of all types and sizes use, use RTP. It's open to any insured depository FI in the United States. Any of them can connect to RTP should they wish. And honestly, we encourage and want them all to do so. 90% of the FIs on the platform today and on the network today are actually, as I mentioned, smaller FIs. By that, I mean they're under $10 billion in assets. Right. And they can be community banks, they can be independent institutions, they can be credit unions. There's all, it's, it's open, as I say, to every and any insured depository. And actually, a large number of them are small to medium enterprises, in addition to some of the big players. What I would say is that where we are right now in the early stages of a, of a piece of payment infrastructure is that receive only, if you like, the ability to receive an instant payment is much easier than obviously sending them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and therefore, we do have a natural progression where institutions tend to join the network with the ability to receive instant payments into their customers' accounts, as you and I want to receive these instant payments that could be sent to us. And then over time, you begin to realize that you also want to have the ability for your customers to send. Now, a send institution obviously has a little bit more work to do. They have to monitor funding levels in the joint account that, that runs with the system so that customers are actually able to send payments 24 by 7. And they need to enable the ability in their online banking channels to permit the origination of a real-time payment through their banking apps or websites or other mechanisms. So sending institutions, there tends to be a, a progression where an institution joins, they receive payments, then over time, they adjust to become a sending institution as well. Okay. Okay. So I'm thinking about it. You mentioned like a lot of the instant payments today, I'm using air quotes with my fingers, um, are, as you point out, not really instant. They're ACH settlement you know, a day or two later, but they appear to be instant to the consumer. What are the use cases that you're seeing flowing through RTP right now that are truly instant? Sure. I mean, there's, there's many examples. I could, I could fill the whole podcast. <laughs> Let me cherry pick a couple of slightly different examples that help accentuate that. The first I would give is, is instant wage access. So, so today, a large, or nearly all of us, tend to receive our electronic income 
through a monthly or every two weeks or weekly sort of payment roll, if you like, payroll file that gets true batch processing. A big file is sent from your ADP or other system off to the ACH network, and these delayed payments happen over a period of time. For certain industries, for certain individuals, that's perfectly fine, and there's no need or desire to change that. However, there is very much a customer need and demand, both on the corporate side as well as on the employee side, for instant wage access in many industries. Mm -hmm. And we see a big increase in that where it comes to two sectors in particular, the, the so-called gig economy, as well as the sort of service industry. So what is instant wage access? You know, if I, if I oversimplify it, it's the idea that when you finish your shift in the restaurant and you, you clock out at the end of the day on your time, immediately afterwards, that system is linked to log your hours for that day, you know, how much money you're due to be paid for that day, and a real-time payment can have that money for your shift in your account seconds after you finish the shift. And that's a very different model from waiting a month to get your pay slip or, or other mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And whether that's the service industry or in the new gig economy where people are perhaps doing a variety of different type of agreements or deals to get paid for the business and the hours and the work that they do, actually is, is proven to be one of the most explosive use cases on the network so far. Another type of example I would give is we have over the ACH network the so-called ACH debit capabilities. So the idea whereby if I know your routing number and I know your account number, you know, I can initiate debits from your account. Something that is unique to the United States. Yes, there are controls in place. They're not necessarily as robust as we might all like or how it's being used is maybe not how we would like it because the control of the funds removal tends to sit with the person who's taking the funds. Now, what we have with RTP is much bigger control on the, the send of the payment, if you like. So I actually, yes, you could make a request for a payment from me, but I control pushing the money out of my account. And that's something that from a real-time payment capability is key, that this is very much a push payment network versus a pool payment network like you see in some aspects of ACH, bringing control back to the person who owns the funds. Uh, and the person who's initiating the payment, but doing so with an overlay like request for payment where you can still have the ability for Verizon to ask you to pay your bill. You just control how it's paid, when it's paid, and the instant nature of its paying. And again, that use case gets very, very interesting when you talk about things like when you want to move money to your brokerage account to do some trading. Well, nobody wants to then move that money and wait three days for it to land into the brokerage account to start trading. The odds are, if you're choosing to move money in, you probably want it to go in straight away. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the ability to have that brokerage account of your own, make a request for payment to your account and that process instantly in real time when you initiate it and have those funds immediately available in your brokerage account is a very different experience than how we do it today as individuals. For sure. For sure. So like you've got a payroll, a run of payroll, and say you've got, and you might have a thousand people sending out money to like someone are going to bank with members of RTP, with people that are set up with RTP. And some will not because you don't, you don't quite have 100% coverage. So what happens when the company is trying to do an RTP process and there's 10, 20% of the banks that these people are banking with where it, they're not part of the send or receive process? So what happens there? It's a really good question and one we discuss a lot. And you know, the question comes up when you don't necessarily have complete ubiquity for a new product and service like you have with an old one, and how do you deal with that interim period? What I would say is that the, the obviously the end state real-time payments, you know, and Fed now is the, is the other player in the market, is for us to have 100% coverage of banks using instant payments. Now, that will happen eventually, although in the U.S., without a mandate, uh, growth is slow and steady. Other countries tend to have mandates and, and they grow a little bit faster or, or have that ubiquity a little bit faster. It's not customary or here in the US for us to rely on mandates for business and commerce. It's not, it's not within our DNA and it's not our approach. As such, we're not necessarily as big bang. We don't have the same sort of seismic event to require all banks to offer instant payments by a certain deadline as you have in many other countries. But RTP has been growing and, and the pace continues to accelerate, particularly with Fed now coming in, and we will get there. So your question is, well, what do we do in the interim? Well, in, in the interim, there's a variety of different options. So some institutions actually work with their clients for a mechanism whereby they send all payments over the RTP network that can settle 
uh, real time and end real time at the destination and then route those that can't to the ACH network for now. And as more and more accounts become available, more and more banks become routing comes to RTP instead of ACH. I think what will happen there as an industry as we get more and more uh, quorums, if you like, across the two platforms, and it's not always about numbers of banks, it's also relative to how many clients, how many accounts, and how many payments each bank makes. But as we grow from the 66% of deposit accounts in the US that are connected to RTP today to a larger number, we'll see more and more of that new availability and ubiquity. Which raises, of course, the other question of as Fed now goes on the same journey, at some point as an industry, much like we did with wire, with ACH, with checks, we'll also have to see what interoperability between those two networks looks like to ensure that across the US economy, we have the most broadest accessibility to instant payments for consumers and corporates around the country. So let's talk about Fed now. I mean, what what is the primary difference uh, between RTP and FedNow? Yeah, so, I mean, the primary difference really revolves around, in most aspects, timing. So the main difference, of course, is that RTP has been running for five years, has a pretty solid track record, and, and has been in continuous operation during that whole time. It has 66%, as I mentioned, uh, coverage of accounts across the country. Three, over 360 banks and credit unions are live. 150,000 businesses are sending payments on it each month. Three million consumers use it every month to move money between accounts. And really, we continue to be on that journey of introducing more and more value-added features to our core offering, whether that's requests for payments, enhanced security, investigating tokenization of account numbers. Really, that's the main difference because Fed is obviously in its infancy. It has 35 financial institutions who are connected. It's very new to the market. And it's going to be coming on that journey with us, but a little bit further delayed. What I will say is that Fed now finally coming live actually gives them another emphasis into the market of the importance of real-time payments. And actually, we've seen a 7% increase in our volumes since the go-live of Fed now, mm. as people actually use the go-live of our competitor to say, yes, this makes sense. Or in many instances, our pipelines are increasing as many banks who've sat on the sidelines because they knew there were be a Fed now are now coming to us and saying, okay, Fed now is going live. We want to do both at once. Can we start talking to you? So we are seeing through Fed now also that increased interest in the product and its use cases, which is great. So then Fed now is obviously a competitor, but it's also it's run by the federal government. So it's a little bit different. They don't have to make a profit necessarily, but they, they could mandate things that, that you guys could never mandate. So I'm just curious about how you feel. I mean, obviously you've been competing with Fed now with, with the Federal Reserve for decades. Like, are you rooting for Fed now to be really successful, or are you rooting for, rooting it for not to be successful and really having RTP become the standard? Or what's the thought process there? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's first of all, I would say is in finance. You know, I have a 20 year career in financial services. I'm used to working with someone on a, on a Monday where they're my client, on a Tuesday it's the other way around, <laughs> and I'm their client. On a Wednesday I'm competing against that same bank or person for, for an RFP of a mutual client. And then on a Thursday we're sitting around the table thrashing through a joint loan book or product offering, and then on a Friday we're side by side at a collaborative industry event with 20 other banks. So that weird environment where your clients of each other, you compete, you collaborate, and you have a vested interest in the broader industry is a little bit how I compare market infrastructures also. So of course, I compete with the Fed, and of course, I, it's my job to make sure that RTP is a hugely successful product. And through competitive spirit, of course, I, uh, I want more volumes than the Fed has and have the, the lion's share of the industry. That said, of course, Fed now is here. We have two instant payment networks in this country. What's most important for the U.S. economy is that instant payments are successful, mm -hmm. regardless to the infrastructure. So both in my role as a custodian of one of those pieces of infrastructure, but also someone who is in essence mandated and comped on a basis of furthering the industry, it's important to me that the topic of instant payment settlement moves forward. Therefore, we do work with the Fed and more so of late, now they're live, work with them on, well, how do we see common areas of interest? that is for the betterment of the economy overall. 
whether that's from the taxpayer funded Federal Reserve or the private sector funded consortium that we are, we actually have the same end goal strategically in sight. We just, of course, each hope that our own platform has the lion's share of the volume when we do so. So there's a lot of room for collaboration as well as competition in that relationship. Right, right. And then what about the credit card networks? Because, you know, Visa Direct, MasterCard Send, they're both um, pushing those as instant payment type uh, you know, mechanisms. Do you feel like they're a competitive threat as well? In a way, yes. Um, but competition is nothing new in payments. And there, there are numerous payment choices for consumers, businesses, banks. Um, and this will likely only continue to proliferate in the way that we are as an industry and in the way that the fintech sector is playing an active role in helping drive our industry forward. Consumers like choice. And it's a good thing for commerce since no one payment solution works for every situation and every customer. There's room for many different kinds. We, you know, we already have ACH, wire, real time. We have different forms of cash, checks. <laughs> Although probably, as I mentioned, that's the one that we do want to go away over time. ACH may be good for a certain type of payment, RTP for another. And yeah, there is room for, for payments over card networks as well in that model. Right, I think right. Visa MasterCard push to card options work well for some of those use cases. But there are other uses where, you know, that instant settlement use case makes a lot more sense. So, you know, where is that? It's when there's a need for much richer data to accompany the payment. It's when there's a desire for settlement to occur real time for that use case. Existing connectivity, for example, use cases such as instant wage access that I spoke to earlier, is much more straightforward over real time payments than would be over, over a card network that in many instances actually is delayed settlement behind the scenes. So there's room for it. There's definite competition, but I think really as an industry and, and as, a, as a user or buyer of the payment capabilities, we have to always think in a use customer use case basis and which one makes the most sense for that particular use case. Right. Got it. So I want to talk about fraud for a minute because I've seen so many articles about FedNow and our instant fraud and you're from the UK. The UK Faster Payments Service has been around for, I don't know, more than a decade. And, you know, Australia as well has had instant payments for a long time. And you guys have been running an instant payments network for five years. How do you handle cases of fraud? And have you seen, you know, a, a lot of attempts with fraud in your system? Yeah, it's, you couldn't get a topic that is more prominent for <laughs> consumers, corporate banks, ourselves. Um, it's huge, right? I mean, as I say, by definition, RTP payments are push payments, meaning the account holder has to authorize and send the payment. 101, that's a better control that we have in some other payment types today. So there's a first step in, the, in how RTP is, is a powerful tool in combating fraud. Now, of course, we all know that large parts of today's fraud does also involve tricking someone to make a payment. In other words, the payment is authorized, but it involves a fraud. There, you know, as a network, we're very aware of the growing trend. And, and as a result, uh, we're growing cautiously, especially for consumer send payments. You know, it's one of the reasons we've set different transaction limit levels over time and slowly increased it to make sure that once we see controls, test them, we get more comfortable, we increase, you know, whether that be volume from an institution to us or, or value level for payment types. Today, P2P payments are focused on sort of me-to-me -me payments where the consumer sender provides its account number and bank, RTN if you like, and Zelle payments with Zelle sort of rules that address fraud loss and allocation. What we're doing is advancing our request for payment capabilities to enable other consumer payments like bill payments and, and, and whatnot to happen over the RTP network with the changing them to push payments from the individual but also do so while introducing warranties and dispute resolution, which are aimed at then ensuring that in that those cases where a fraud does happen, a consumer will get their money back. So it's a little bit too funded around how you try and prevent the fraud happening in the first place and how you make sure that if it does happen, you have the right mechanisms in place to actually deal with the warranties and the dispute resolution around it. But as a result, I think what we see is that push payments have always had and continue to have a lower rate of fraud than pool payments, like you know we see in the check fraud that continues to increase year on year, debit fraud that's been estimated at around $1.2 billion annually by the ABA. You know, I think we see a lot of potential for RTP to remove those fraud free. We have to continually be vigilant on top of that, not just today, but 
going forward and do that not alone. Do that with the banks. Right, right. Okay. I want to close with looking towards the future and, you know, we're here in this sort of hybrid world now where we've got cash, we've got checks, we've got ACHY or instant payments and various different uh, other things that are being developed. But what is your vision for the future of instant payments? Are we going to live in a world where most electronic payments are going to be done instantly? And what what's that going to look like? Simple answer for me is yes. I mean, much like everything else in society, there is a much greater focus on instant. Consumers and businesses expect instant availability for purchase of the service and product that they're looking at, whether it's Amazon working out how they can get your deliveries to you quicker and quicker and quicker, or or, or how your you know ability to call a cab is drastically increased in terms of instant availability through platforms like Uber or the streaming of media through Netflix where you want it instantly and at your touch, whether it's free or, or paper play for purchase. The, the entire industry or multiple industries are moving towards that instant landscape. And payments is no different. It's moving in the same direction, instant availability. I think what you don't hear as often is someone sort of sitting around the dinner table saying, I really wish my payments were instant. You know, I, I don't know, maybe occasionally at my dinner parties, but it's just me <laughs> talking and nobody knows what I'm talking about. But in reality, what people are asking for in terms of the instant availability of other products and services has a direct correlation to then the instant payment that comes with it. Payments used to be years ago, 20, 30 years ago, payments were an afterthought. How you paid for your service happened way after you got the service or product. Sometimes you had a credit account or people would mail you an invoice or payment was an afterthought for the back office and for the sort of the collections team, if you like. That changed where payments actually became a product in itself about 10, 15 years ago. They were managed more in the front office of both banks and corporates by treasury teams became more important. Suddenly corporate treasurers were being invited to the board meetings when before the boards didn't know what the department was. Where we are today is we've gone to the next evolution of that. Payments are actually embedded in the design of a product and service office or Amazon that I mentioned before. They have payment e departments of their services because when they actually design products and services, they want to understand how they can make that payment aspect happen instantaneously at the same time. So it's embedded into the actual design of future state products and services, which is a very, very different world from where we were when ACH was founded and payments were sort of mailed out in an invoice, you know, please pay within 30 days and the check was mailed back or ACH payment made. And I think that drive is what will really lead us to that instant payments environment that is there to support and be part of the instant products and service environment that we move to in this technological day and age. Okay, Dave, we'll have to leave it there. Really fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Peter. It was a pleasure and a topic that, that I'm very, very passionate about, as are many out there. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you so much for listening. Please go ahead and give the show a review on the podcast platform of your choice and go tell your friends and colleagues about it. Anyway, on that note, I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening. And I'll catch you next time. Bye.